the design of the invitation is made that people, uh, in, in, when they participate, they don't start looking at like world corruption or uh, you know, child trafficking, like, you know. All yeah, but it's also the energy, it's not me, it's them, it's, it's uh, yeah. you know. But through this process, you, you discover that there is no difference. Yes. So on, on a human su superficial level, of course, they are there, they are the enemy, they are the bad guys. Yes. But then you start to realize, once you, through that practice, all the time look at those situations from your compassionate heart, you start to realize, like, I am that too. Yes. Because from a place of source, you are not just the happy feelings, but you are also the darkness. Yes. And that becomes really apparent initially for your own little favorite problem that you work with in that week. Yes, but are you able to do that to say, I am that too? Well, I'm because it's, you, you realize it's hard for most people, right? I, it's very hard, and it's and it's really intense. Yes. So start to recognize that everything that appears to be external is also source energy. It's not external, and it's also part of who you are. But also your own reaction to that, yes. consciously and subconsciously, is that source energy. Regardless of the practice, whether it would be the invitation or Oho Pono Pono, if you are doing that with uh, the intent to fix clouds. <laughs> <laughs> or Bill, or try to remove them from the world stage, that's not going to work. What would be the right intention then? The, the main factor that determines if compassion works is your uh, ability to accept every possible outcome without expectations. Mm. Okay. So that means that if you would embrace Klaus Schwab, basically the whole, either he would disappear or die, or like, oh, that's a miracle <laughs> that we create, or he would just stay in power and would, would do his own his whole thing, yes. his power trip. But because if we have fully, let's say as a humanity, we have we would have fully embraced that, would that still be a problem? Yes. But that's the that's the interesting question, right? Because we think that we suffer from something that is outside of us. Yes. And then as a result of that, we think like if that situation outside of us, in this example, Klaus is not no longer there, we don't suffer anymore. Yes. Right? That's how the mind works. Yeah. But the, I mean, we but, give him too much power, right? Oh, Klaus still exists, I suffer. That's right. Oh, Klaus is dead now, oh, now I feel good, right? I mean, it's, it's like child's play, right? But what we come to realize as a result of a practice like this is that we don't suffer from Klaus, but we suffer from our resistance to Klaus. Hello everyone, this is The Invitation, and the author of The Invitation is here, and his name is Juno Burger. Good to see you, Juno. You too, Baptiste. Thanks. You know, we've been following each other for, I think, many years now, I think at least eight years, but this is the first time we actually meet in person. Yeah, that's miraculous, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. after eight years. Um, you have a new book here, The Invitation and it's doing very well. Can you share with us what, what is it about? Yeah, it's, it started in the summer of uh, 2020 as a, a community project, basically um, instigated by the idea like, you know, in these times that we are living in, like what can people actually do for themselves? And um, I think because of the times we're living in, there's a lot of information available. A lot of people wake up to certain things, to certain realities. Uh, and at least that, as I, how I look at it is that part of that awakening process is that you also realize that you have to clean up your garden before we can actually move on. And um, basically the, the invitation is designed to help people to give them a practice, a very simple practice that they can do for themselves to make whatever is there that is still subconscious, unconscious, to make that conscious, make it aware uh, and deal with that in such a way that it doesn't have to go back into the subconscious. And I think that's an important step for people that wake up to sort of do that practice before they can actually grow up into a new phase. So uh, initially it was a practice for individuals to do for themselves. And we started this uh, online uh, in a Facebook community uh, that started one and a half year ago with, well, approximately 300 people. And now uh, 18 months down the road, there's more than 8,000 people every month because the invitation is a practice that starts uh, every first day of the month for a period of seven days. Mm -hmm. So now it's 8,000 people that do the same practice every month. And the effect of that is that you create a community that is based on compassion and awareness. So that's basically the second benefit of it. So it's an individual practice, but because you do it with so many people, 
uh, that all do the same practice in a very coherent way, uh, that also has an effect on everybody that's in that community. So you actually support each other um, from that place of awareness and compassion. And the third effect is basically because we are part of like a bigger universe, like the one field, of course, is that that compassionate field that we build through doing that practice uh, is available for well, the collective, you could say. Mm. So yeah, that's that's how it's designed, um, and um, yeah, it, it's been proven to be very uh, efficient for people individually. But a lot of people feel the resonance. I think that's why it's grown so mm. so quickly over a short period of time. Mm. Uh, I think intuitively because people feel like you know, if you want to go beyond polarization, and that's of course the time we live in. Yeah you have to move to a different place of inclusivity. Yeah. And that is, of course, well, I don't have to tell you, this is, this is all about the heart, of course. Yes. So the practice has been designed to bring compassion and awareness together. And those two elements, they forge a key that fits into the door of your compassionate heart. Mm. And once you enter that space, you, well, you actually go beyond duality. And you can experience all sorts of things from a very different place. So it's still the same situation, but the experience is very different. Mm. Beautiful. Um, you know, you were talking about the times that we live in, and I think your book is the right book for this time. Um, and because a lot of people are questioning their reality, they are questioning what is real. Uh, we live in the time of the pandemic, and we had, you know, books and films like The Secret, where we use the law of attraction to create our reality. Mm -hmm. um, And we have a time now where a lot of people are being challenged uh, in terms of, you know, economics, in terms of uh, job security, in terms of, you know, how is my future going to be? Um, how can uh, the invitation help them? Um, well, I, th I think that if you look at uh, people's lives individually, but also, I mean, the, the world we live in now, I see that. Uh, in terms of creation. So for me, that's all creation. So I think all the, the stuff that's not sustainable is in the end a reflection of the things mm. in ourselves that are not sustainable. So I think if you want to... Um, because part of that whole pandemic situation is, of course, the huge polarization. And it doesn't really matter yes. on which side of the fence you are. Because if you choose one over the other, there will still be charge. There will still be polarization. So I think what this practice helps them is to, to get an insight into those subconscious aspects that create a reality or at least co-create a reality that is not really sustainable. Uh, but of course, that's, that's a phase of crisis because if you start to look inside and you start to see yourself, uh, well, in the seat of the creator and there's all sorts of situations in your life that are not really helpful, uh, then all of a sudden, well, you're confronted with that reality that you've created from a subconscious place. And people are just not used to looking at their life uh, like that. We don't grow up with the idea like, oh, I'm really the creator of my own reality. So I think a lot of people feel that they are disempowered in a way. Yeah. Stuff happens to them, life overcomes them, and they don't feel like they really have a grip on that. And I think what, what this practice offers is like, a very safe way to go into those parts that we naturally sort of try to avoid mm -hmm. because I mean nobody is really very eager to go into the darkness of course yeah. because we fear that stuff that is yeah. there because it's too big it's too painful it's too shameful um, so I think I think safety that is offered by compassion is a very important ingredient so this mm -hmm. practice helps them to very gently and very in a very controlled way with a lot of help from the community to move into those areas that they're well, sort of more or less trying to stay away from and very gently uh, make that stuff aware that lives there, which is also trauma, of course. Mm. Um, it can be anything, really. But also to deal with that in such a different way that it's actually giving a stage and it gets that one thing that they all well, look for, all these yeah. elements of life look for, and that's recognition, that's acknowledgement, because they're all aspects of life. Mm. And then what happens, I think, because people go through those aspects that create, well, non-sustainable realities, they, they come into contact with something else. And I call that the undercurrent or the flow, you could also call it. And I think especially for people that, that feel that stuff doesn't work yes. anymore in their life, but they don't know yet what does work, is that this practice offers them, I call this the, I call this the waiting room, like an intermediate space where you can actually yes. work with that stuff that is in the way. Yes. And you transform that stuff. Yes. 
And then at the same time, although that's, that's a bit risky because a lot of your identity is built around those stories, of course, yeah. even though they don't work for you. Yeah. And then because you transform that, you, you feel that there's a safety net. So it, it offers a lot of safety and support, I think, from life itself. But it also allows the flow to come to your life and give direction and give energy and purpose. And I think that will help people to move into a different reality that's much more beneficial for themselves. And as a result of that, of course, also for mm. the, for the mm. collective. Mm. Um, earlier, we were talking about the work of Abram Hicks. And in, Ab in, in, in uh, the Abram Hicks theory, the premise is that we are all source energy. And yeah. as long as we align with that source energy, we get the right ideas, the right guidance, the right insights. Um, and our life uh, is in a flow. And Esther always says, happy, 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 happy. And then we die, you know, our, our life could be happy uh, all the time as long as we are aligned with that source uh, energy. Mm. Um, is that also what you believe? Well, I do believe that everything is source energy, but I also believe that, that the dark side or the subconscious or the stuff we try to avoid is also that same source energy. So um, I, th I think... Uh, that if you would only focus on the positive or only focus on higher frequencies at the expense of, let's say, the lower frequencies, mm -hmm. that's not going to help us because you still reject that part that is also source energy, which manifests as, you know, dark energies or worries yeah, or source. Can we talk a little bit about the mechanics? If you start to align with higher frequencies, with yeah. higher light in yeah. a way, yeah, mm -hmm. then what happens with the negative aspects, with the dark darker sides that depends if, if you only focus on the higher energies and you reject the lower energies they will stay there and they will actually gain more energy as a result of being rejected but can the lower energies the darker energies can they still exist at higher levels of frequency no they can't no but but for me if you would focus on the higher frequencies that would be the, the frequencies that include the lower energies mm -hmm. so you won't reject them or judge them or fear them or deny them but actually by well let's say facing them and embracing them yes. the, you would integrate them so you neutralize the lower energies but because you include them from a place of compassion so i think from if you would look at lower energies from source energy so if you would see yourself like in the highest you know mm -hmm. place uh, you would still recognize those lower energies as your own creation. Yes. And if you would look at them from a place of your own creation, you would never reject them. You would never fear them or try yes. to protect yourself from them or judge them. Yes. You would actually, like a mother, bring them home. Yes. And I think that, for me, that's the way to deal with, let's say, lower frequencies. Yes. And, 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 and can you speak a little bit on, because you say we are creators, but actually you say we are co-creators. If we are creators, we are 100% responsible. If we're co-creators, we're not 100% responsible. Yeah. Well, the, the tricky thing from, from creation is that the biggest part of what we create is from the subconscious. So we don't know actually... So it's actually like estimated 10% of conscious creative power. And that's, of course, the part that we understand, that we know, that we take responsibility for or credits or we're proud of. But the biggest part from the creative energy comes from the subconscious. And of course, because it's subconscious, you don't know what it is and that it's there. You can't take responsibility for that. But I think if you make the darkness conscious, so you make the subconscious conscious and you integrate that and make it part of your conscious creative force, yes. then it becomes, of course, a responsible yes. part of yourself. Yes. So until, until, until the point that it becomes conscious, I think it's co-creation because that energy looking for acknowledgement, if you don't look inwards, if you don't have a practice like yoga or meditation or you don't drink ayahuasca or whatever it is that you do to investigate your inner world, then eventually life will help you, of course, by presenting all sorts of people and situations in your life that remind you yes. of those two things. Like the first thing is like you are a creator of this reality, one-on-one, -on -one. and at the same time by what it is, the sort of situations, life will sort of point out, like, look, if you still... You know, have all these angry situations, angry people, people get angry at you or you get angry. That's like an indication that life wants to point out, like, look, maybe you have issues around anger yes. that you haven't made aware, you haven't embraced yet, you haven't integrated. Yes. So until you do that, they will stay there yes. and they will still be like creating part of your reality. Yes. So, but what is happening in terms of creation, when you are only experiencing good things all the time. Happy. 
Well, it could mean that you are fooling yourself <laughs> because you only focus on those things and you just ignore the not so happy things. And is that a bad situation? Uh, no, it's not good or bad, but I think eventually the freight train, the freight train will catch up. Okay. Because but, it's not But is it necessary for us to have negative experiences? Um well, I don't know if it's necessary, but I think it, it's part of life. I think it's because of how we how we see the, these experiences that we label them as negative. Yes. But from a source point of view, they're just experiences. Yes, but you've you've had those times where you know everything is in flow, synchronicities yeah, all yeah, the time, yeah. uh, and, and for longer periods of time actually. Yeah. So what does that tell you if that happens? I th I think th that you are creating from a very sound place, very clear place, and that maybe. Um, well, either I, it could also mean that you've worked through your shadow parts, yes. or you just don't have them, right? Yes. Uh, which did, is which is very possible. But did you ever had it like, wow, so so many good things are happening, uh, you know, and and you were not even aware of, of of it in terms of the creation of it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Did you ever have? have yeah, 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 sure, yeah, sure. Many of those moments, flow yes. moments, and I think that's so interesting. This guy uh, from uh, I think he's from Czechia, Chick Have you heard of this guy? Is it, he wrote a book about flow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Many uh, years ago. Yeah, and uh, what, I mean, he interviewed a lot of people that had flow experiences, and basically, uh, what all of them are saying is that at the moment they had those experiences, they, they had the feeling they weren't there. Yes. So life actually worked through them. This is what you're saying, so right? So we, we have to get out of our own way. That's that's the whole thing, yes. yeah. And then if you get out of the way, which is what the invitation process is about, yeah. basically getting the big rocks out of the river. Yes. Uh, and if you do, the river is still there and it will start to flow. Okay, so, so Jim Carrey once said, you know, we, he, um, he was describing his... Um, experience of total bliss and happiness. Yeah. And he said, and since then I've been trying to get there. Yeah. Again, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, yeah that's the problem. <laughs> point being that it's hard to get there if you try to get there. Yeah. So trying to get there is actually coming from the ego, right? Yeah. Um, so how do we get out of our own way? Well, I, th I think th this process of actually uh, opening, or uh, I think it starts with the realization that when you come here as a human being, you ha you are equipped to actually. I think live here in this 3D reality with all the limitations of what it means to be human, um, but really experience the full spectrum. And I think if you do so, that you um, you basically enrich yourself because you consciously let all these different frequencies or energies or information, doesn't matter how you call it, you let that in. And by doing that in a very conscious and compassionate way, you actually integrate those frequencies yes. in your system. You train the, the, the nervous system on that level to recognize those frequencies. Yes. And then I think eventually if you go through the whole spectrum, so that's the light part and the darkness, of yes. course, basically everything, what it means to be human, um, because of that integration process, you activate a sort of a transparency in the system where you can have all those experiences, but you don't take them personally. Yes. You you don't fall in the in the in the trap that you think like oh because I feel it in the body it's mine and you don't go looking for meaning or purpose or explanation and you don't have to fix it because you sort of realize and remember that if you experience something and you can completely embrace it it will just have its natural timing to leave the system again and I think then you're out of the way mm -hmm. so it means that life can actually flow through you mm -hmm. everything every aspect of it but it won't have an adverse effect on you. Mm. Because it's it's not you don't get in the way. And I think we get in the way because we take all those experiences personally. We go, you know, on a search, we try to understand what it means. I mean the, the seeking energy, like you know, going into all these yes. dimensions and stories, yes. trying to figure out what is wrong with you. Yes. And then the promise of that seeking energy is of course that once you sort of map that out, you can do something to control it, yes. you know, to fix it. Like either you want to get rid of it if it's really uncomfortable. Or if it's a really nice feeling, you want to hang on to it as long as you can. But that's the same problem energetically. Yes. Yes. And I think those three elements, like taking your world of experience personally, trying to understand what it means and consequently trying to fix it, that's what's creating all this charge around those experiences. And that's what we experience in the body as stress. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, as, a, as an energy of contraction, like cramp, it just blocks, all, blocks the flow. And that's, that's basically the big rocks we throw into the river. Mm -hmm. So once you sort of see that process, and I think that's everybody does that quite unaware. Um, yeah, it's just turning that around. So if you start experiencing whatever it is there is, 
uh, and you don't take it personally anymore, and you don't go looking for meaning, and you don't try to fix it because you know that you know it fixes itself. That's for me a very practical way to get out of the way, mm-hmm. and then everybody who does it experiences the same thing because they feel that there is something underlying that catches them, and then you know pushes them in the, in the right direction. We're talking. You mentioned the word seeking, and we are talking about seeking in a way. Uh, Jesus said, "Seek first the kingdom of heaven within, and then all else will be added unto you." Yeah. And Eckhart Tolle said, "If you get the inside right, then the outside will fall into place." Yeah, same thing. But they're talking about something that's inside of us, so we should not look outside of us for answers. I agree. I agree. And yet, it, it's through our outside experience that we can get an insight into our inner world. But is it like a, a feedback system or outside? Yeah, yeah, I think it's biofeedback. Yeah. It's actually a mirror. Yeah. So yeah. You, you talk about three phases wake up, clean up, grow up. Yeah. What is that about? Well, this is actually uh, coined by Ken Wilbur. Yeah. So he saw that a lot of people, I think, through uh, all sorts of practices, wake up to a certain reality. And I think that's, you know, that's also, I think, what your book did. And I think many other practices wake people up to basically very old knowledge that we're all one, that everything is connected and everything is energy. And our true identity is a soul. Yeah, well, that that is a bit a cultural thing because, for for example, Buddhists, they don't believe in the soul. So it's it's also like... I look at it more from an energetic point of view. But do you believe in a soul? I don't. Okay. No. So what do you believe in? Uh, in life, <laughs> basically. Yeah. But it, I mean, it's all, maybe it's just semantic, right? You could say spirit, yeah. soul, That's life. What, yeah. yeah, I think we all mean the same thing. But I think, I think many people use the soul still as a very individual thing. Yes. Like there's the, the, um, Brecht Arnard uh, was here and he said, I don't believe in the soul. There's just one energy field in a way. Do you yeah. believe it's that? Or? Yeah. Well, I, think I, 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 I sort of resonate with the Buddhist practice because what they say is that, I mean, they, they make a, a big effort to sort of prevent that if you die physically, that the charge do, that you haven't resolved during your life, um, if you don't resolve that at the moment of physical death, that charge will be projected into what they call the bardos, right? The, so the afterworld. And that charge energetically creates like all sorts of experience in those realities and eventually just clicks onto a new body and that's what they see as reincarnation. And is this also a form of karma? Yes. yes. Yeah. So it's basically the unresolved stuff that makes another circle to be resolved, yes. basically. Yes. Um, but they don't see that as an individual process yes. that is connected to a soul. So they hint sometimes even at that the whole con- concept of the soul could be a construct of the mind. Yes keep the story going after physical death. I like that idea, just to investigate it, right? But, but you, 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 we could say that you are Juno Burger, you're a soul in a body having the experience of the human Juno Burger right now. Yeah. And of course you can say, ah, but this is all coming from the mind. Yeah, right? yeah. I think it's very difficult to, to, for the mind to sort of describe yeah. that concept. Yeah. 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 But I think through, I think because we are multidimensional beings, I mean, apart from this experience here, we probably hang out in different galaxies and Absolutely. all sort of gather experiences yeah. that are sort of connected and come together and are all interrelated as well. So I think what the mind does is try to sort of bundle that into something that we can identify with. Yes. But I think it's still at some subtle level, still a level of identification. I think. In a way, people speak about it, right? They say that you are an old soul. or you have yes. get, So in a, in a sense, that sort of gives away that it happens in time and space, which yes. is, of course, the dimension of the mind. Yes. So I just like to sort of go beyond those concepts and then see what happens. Yeah. Yes. So you mentioned the heart earlier. What, we, because we were talking about the mind right now. Yeah. What is the role of the heart? Well, what I what I like is that um, that description in uh, in the old Vedas where they speak about the tiny space in the heart, where they actually say that our whole human existence is in the mind, and by definition, because it happens in the mind, it's uh, dualistic, it's polarized, but there is still one aspect of us intact, which they call the tiny space in the heart, where we can experience from a place of oneness. Mm-hmm. So it's the only place in our human experience where there is no polarity. So for me, that actually describes it. So for me, the heart is like a metaphor that we can look at life from the place of, cre- of the creator, you could basically say. Because as long as we are in the human experience, we, have, we experience that duality. Yes. And yet at the same time, we, there is like a backdoor in a software program where you can also look at that same life, but then from a very different perspective. And then 
the energetics of that experience are quite different as well. So, you know, the, 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 those three things that I just described that are typically for the mind, that you take stuff personally and you go looking for meaning and you try to fix it, that's all the mind. But the heart would look at that same situation and would never take that experience personally because it isn't. It's just life unfolding. Uh, it wouldn't go look for where it comes from because it's beyond time and space. It's just there. It's just life, you know, unfolding itself. Uh, and it wouldn't need fixing because it's already perfect. It's just creation. And in a very yeah, my mystical way, you could say, as a human being, we have that, well, it's almost like, a, it feels like a privilege that we can take those two perspectives yes. in life and, and experience what, it, yeah, what the difference is. So for me, the, I use the, the compassionate heart as a metaphor, like really a space where you can actually go to, enter, yes. and really feel and experience a situation in your life or a problem or doesn't matter what it is from that place of boundlessness, from unity, from oneness. And that's, uh, that's in a sense, a very um, yeah, mystical experience. It's, it's, it's really alchemy what happens there. Yes. Are you familiar with the work of uh, Drun Valo Melchizedek? Yes, I am. Yes. yes. Because yes. He's, I think it's, it's in his work. Yeah. What you're talking it's about. It's very similar. Yeah. 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 yeah, I think he found the same thing out. And it's, it's funny because in his uh, travels, he sort of tried to get an insight in how the heart works through many native tribes, and they, um, they, ha they have difficulty, uh, difficulty explaining it to him because yeah. for them it's just so natural. They're like, you don't know this. <laughs> and then, you know, they try to explain and explain, and then just eventually one of the shamans just gives him a direct experience, and then, you know, he feels it. Yeah. And then the challenge is, of course, to, uh, to say it in words. It's, it's impossible. I, and I think my experience after trying this for a long time, also explaining it to people, is that it's beyond words. And it's, it's the one thing that the mind can't comprehend, but also can't explain. So, you know, why are we here? Are we here um, to evolve um, or are we here to experience or both? Well, I don't think, sometimes people say like it's, it's the evolution of consciousness, but I don't think consciousness has to, has to evolve. That's already everything. Yes. So I don't believe in that. But I think, well, basically what you were saying, I think by getting out of the way, I think our evolution is, is to eventually experience more and more the place that we already came from and already know. But I think that's just by becoming more inclusive human beings. And that happens through experience. Yes. It, the, the whole spectrum. Yes. And this is what's happening, of course. I think. Well, although, we, although being a human being is a, just an experience, temporarily. Yes. yes, in this dimension, yeah, yeah, it is, yeah. Because it's not who we really are. Well, from a point of creation, we, we are that. Yes. So this is, this is, again, that... that From the point of creation, we are a human being. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, but sometimes people say, like, you are not this body, you are not this human yeah. experience. But you are. Yes. So I believe you are, eh? you're not your thoughts, yes. but that's only relevant for, for the seeker, you could say, yes. for the human being. But from a place of creation, so if you go, if you enter the heart, you would recognize that that thought that the human being identified with is actually your own creation. So you are that thought. So if you, if you look at the cycle that you go through as a human being, you, you come from oneness, yes. and that means you are everything, and you go into separation, into duality, and then you feel you're not that anymore. And then in the end of the circle, you realize that you are that. Yes. But then you have also, well, if everything goes right, you have also integrated the whole human experience. Mm. If, if you look at the work of Eckhart Tolle, at one point he becomes aware of the fact that he is not thinking his thoughts, but he is the observer of his thoughts and that his thoughts are not coming from him. They're just like clouds that come and go. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So who is producing those thoughts? Yeah, that's the big mystery. And who is observing those thoughts? Yeah. Because even... Even the observer, yeah. Even being the observer is still a very dualistic perspective yes. because you have still... Still you have two things, the observer and what is observed. Yes. And then what's beyond that? Because most <laughs> people identify with their thoughts and think they are thinking their thoughts. Yeah. Uh, They're not. Which no. is probably not the case, no, because I, no. because you think you think those thoughts, but you don't. Yeah. But you identify with those thoughts, yeah, that, and they're not yours. Exactly. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's the problem with what Buddhists call attachment to body consciousness, is that we, we think or we believe actually that everything that happens in the body or that we perceive through the body is actually ours. Yes. And then through that practice of sort of, you know, detaching yourself in a way from it, you come to realize that those are two different things. Like, oh, there is the experience and there is that thing in me, in the body, yes. that thinks that it's having that experience. Yeah. So they become two things, of course. Yeah. But then eventually when you start to realize that those things just appear in consciousness, that's life, right? And then the big question is, do is there someone in you that clings on to that, like Velcro, and says like, oh, this is mine. Like we start a museum, you know, we collect all these things and we actually attract them. Yeah. And because we hold on to them, we become them. That's, yeah. that's the bizarre thing about it. So if people tell themselves that they are angry, like I'm angry for 30 years, their whole physiology yeah. becomes anger. <laughs> you can see that. Yes, because they start to identify, but you could say, you're not angry, you think you are angry. Yeah, but yes, no, that's a good start. Yes, that is a good start. And then eventually, of course, you find out that not one thought, not one physical sensation, not one emotion, not one, you know, uh, feeling is actually yours, yes. which is really liberating, but also very threatening to the personality because our personality is built, up, built around that belief that we are all those things. So, th of course, if you realize like, oh, I'm not that, Okay, then what are you? Then what's left, right? So that's, that's I think, the, the tension that a lot of people deal with. Like, on one hand, they want to be liberated from that sort of false identification. Yes. And at the same time, they try to protect it because that, yeah, pre pre provides a sort of fake safety. Yes, and it's hard to say, oh, I, I now realize that I'm the great nothing, right? Yeah, that's a bit abstract, right? <laughs> <laughs> try to get away with that. But, you know, in terms of compassion, it really helps because if you realize that whatever it is that you think is actually yours is not yours, that also, of course, is the same for the person who is in front of you. Yeah. So eventually you will just see that it's just stuff arising. It's nobody's. Yes. Well, I, I, I really like it. It is stuff arising. We don't know where it, where it comes from, but it is arising. Yeah. But we should happening. not identify with it too much. Right? Yeah, not at all. But But... The risk of identifying, and this is what I see a lot with people, is that if they, if they try to detach from it or become the observer, is that they, that very often has an element of rejection or not going. Yeah. So you actually think like, oh, that, that stays there. But then again, compassion becomes important again. Because yeah. Compassion just means, I think, and you agree with that, to be with. So that's, that's the suggestion with the invitation. It's not to sort of become the observer and, and create this huge space between it, but actually move towards it or let it move to, towards you, let it in the body and use the intelligence of the body to have that experience. Yes. That's the whole idea of coming here, right? Yes. So yes. to experience whatever is here to experience, but to experience that with awareness and compassion. Yes. And then that perspective of being the observer becomes a perspective of being inclusive. And then you become that emotion again, in a very strange way, but from a different perspective, from the perspective of the heart. And then there is no need to, then the observer and the feeling become the same thing again. Yes. And that's how you bring it home. Yes. And that's where that whole process of transmutation happens. So actually, by bringing a conflict, conflict into the compassionate heart and fully embracing it, that will sort of take away the charge, but we will also come back into its most original stage, which is love. Yes. You bring it back to source energy, and that's the, that's the capacity of the heart to be able to do that. You know, you talk about uh, syntropy, that's negative entropy. Right? Yeah. Um, entropy is a state of disorder, randomness, and uncertainty. Right? Yeah. So, can you speak a little bit about syntropy? Yeah, syntropy is, is a bit of a, a mystical uh, phenomena, but it, 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 maybe it's the simple, the simple way to describe it is that it's... So, like, entropy is like everything is falling apart, right? So it comes from the past and everything is just falling apart. Like, if you live in a house and you don't live there for 20 years, the energy just... everything just collapses, right? Yes. So that's basically a part of our life. Is And at the same time, we are drawn to a point in the future, you could say, so a point that, that reels us in from the future, which is actually convergent to that point. And those two things happen at the same time. So on one hand, we are sort of held back by our past, like the stuff that we drag behind us. And at the same time, we are sort of, you could say, called by the future to, to come home, to come to a point of purpose. And we are connected with those 
two energies at the same time. But of course, if like you have this big sort of past dragging behind you, which is holding you back, the, the big rocks in the river, it's very difficult because that is so dominant in your experience. It's very difficult to sort of connect with that future possibility, that other timeline, which is really about well, who you really are, I think. So my experience is, and I think from a lot of people, that if you clean up your stuff, so I think that's this phase of waking up and then you realize like, oh, a big part of who I am is also not conscious yet. And when you start to make that conscious and you start to embrace it and you start to let the charge fall away, so the sandbags from, you know, the hot air balloon that wants to rise are sort of, you know, falling off the basket. And uh, then that purpose becomes much more obvious because it's still, it was always there calling you, but you were just not home listening to it. Mm -hmm. So then I think people will start to make choices that are much more beneficial for themselves. Yeah. But, but should we be aware of our purpose um, if we just focus on creating the best alignment with our source energy now? Is that not enough? Because our purpose will reveal itself in every moment then. Yeah, but it's. I think it's it's filtered through that that subconscious part that we haven't made aware yet. So um, I think you have to do both. And I think you know a lot of people try to envision a better world, but they they do it from the point of where they are now, which is again that biggest part, which is subconscious. So if we think about a better world, that's always based on who we are now. And if we resolve that sort of subconscious part, the darkness in ourselves, we become a much rich, richer person. And then something else, uh, this is what Jung describes as the third way. So actually holding the, the charge between the polarities and holding that charge long enough from a place of compassion will create some, that sort of goes into a state of alchemy, which creates a third possibility, something that we can never think about. So it's just life that is surprising us and offering us like solutions like, oh yeah, of course, that's a thing to do. Yes. And they're probably very obvious and very natural. But if you start trying to think about them, that's really difficult. So if you try to... Yeah, but, but thinking is coming from the mind. Yeah. And the mind is very limited. It's linear, yeah. rational, logical. Yeah, sure. Uh, but our source energy, once we align with that, is holistic. Is yeah, is, is is is... is is not linear at all, so it can just pump, come up with a solution in that moment. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. that's called intuition, of course. But. Yes. Yeah, I, I hear what you say. And I think still part of uh, aligning to source energy is still influenced by those parts that, I mean, eventually everything is source energy, of yes. course. Yes. So I think you, you, there is no shortcut or way around that you also have to face those things that we may label now as not source energy, but of yes. course they are. Yes, because everything is source energy. Eventually it is. Also the dark parts. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So um, there is nothing wrong with the dark parts or the dark side, right? No. But um, how do we change it around? If people are in a dark place in their lives right now, and many people are, what can they do to create a more lighter reality? Um, yeah, for me, that starts with the acknowledgement that they are in a dark place. Yeah. And okay, you're there, you acknowledge that. What is then the second step? Well, there, there is no second step. Okay. Because the acknowledgement of what is there, which is everything included, will give way to a light or reality. And that will just happen naturally. Okay. So they, they, there's nothing they need to do? or No, that's the weird thing. Okay. If, you, if you think about this process of um, what the invitation suggests, it's that you bring awareness, which is about noticing your state of being as it is now. And that's not doing something, of course, that's just noticing. Yes. And consequently, com bringing that together with compassion, which means that you let whatever it is that you're noticing be as it is without wanting to change it. And, and that's also not doing something. So two things that are actually about not doing something, they come together and then something happens. And this is why it's so, so difficult for the mind to understand that. Yes. And then, of course, the question is, who is noticing? Yeah, that, again. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. But because is it the mind? I, I think when you say noticing, it's not you referring to the mind. Well, I don't think your ability to notice is per se constructed by the mind, because that's 
yeah, that's a very mystical thing. I mean, I still, I don't, I don't think we still understand what consciousness really is, yeah. right? That's a big question. What is it? Yeah. So, yeah, uh, who's noticing? But of course, you, as a human being, you can notice. There is, there is human awareness, you could say. Um, but the weird thing is that that's, that something happens very, yeah, mysteriously, basically, you could say, um, that is noticeable. So there is a shift because if you combine those things again, you come back, you come into that place of the compassionate heart and that acknowledgement basically um, lets the charge around those difficult aspects of your life fall away. And because you encounter them from a place of compassion, you also integrate them. And that will give way to, to movement. You come out of contraction, come out of a dark place. We could say we have a guidance system, right? I mean, you can yeah. feel when something feels bad. Yeah. You can feel hate. Um, we can feel love. And love feels much better than hate. Love feels like space. Yeah. Uh, hate feels like contraction, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So should we not use our guide, you know, emotional guidance system? Mm -hmm. Um, to notice where we are. Yeah, but I think, yes, of course. Yeah. But that's, of course, what, what the body, it helps you to, you know, through the senses to have that experience. And of course, they are very different. I mean, hate feels very different than yes. love. Yes. Uh, but of course, I think it also is a, is a matter of definition, what, it, what is love, right? Yes. Because from a, from a very high perspective, there's also love for the phenomenon of hate. Yes. So, but if you never connect really to hate and really feel it, which is like a very intense experience, of course, um, yeah, you don't know what it is. So we have an idea about what it is, but we don't really experience from a, experience it from a, the perspective of love. And once we do that, we can do that. Yes. Then we disempower that. Absolutely. From you know the destructive yeah. effects it have, and until that time, it just starts to to be very. Poisonous, you could say. Yes. Um, what did you learn from Eric Dorset? Uh, basically, the the basic principles of this uh, type of energy work. Yes. Yeah, yeah. He's the the founder of uh, a method that's called energy clearing. Yes. And um, yeah, that's a, that's an interesting story because as a young kid, he uh, he had a very strong connection with Buddhism. His parents weren't Buddhist. He was raised in, in England. Uh, you know, went to a Catholic school, but he still had that sort of, well, almost a memory or a recognition maybe from, you know, a, another life experience that was built into his system. So he came with that, I think, intuitive knowledge and understanding of Buddhism. And then later on, uh, he moved to uh, Sri Lanka. He lived with, uh, with, monk, with Buddhist monks there and they recognized that, right? That's part of that tradition that they sort of like... <laughs> Uh, resonate with that and they could see that you know he, he already came with some wisdom yes. and then um, not much longer after that he started to notice that people would react to his presence so you know he would go to let's say a birthday party and it, someone would sit next to him with a headache and then after five minutes they would say like oh that's nice the headache is gone right and they would you know they would say that to him and he was like okay I didn't do anything you know or he would go to somebody's house and then they would say that their house feels better after that. And I was like, oh, that's weird. Because, you know, he started to... Hmm? But then he realized, like, oh, maybe it's this, this built-in sort of Buddhist knowledge or memories or principles of awareness and compassion that are all already sort of established in me uh, that create this, this, well, aura of peace around me that people respond to. And that's, of course, what, what this whole practice and this form of energy work does. Because of a compassionate presence... You invite the, the tension of another person or the, the charge that is left in a space yes. to come to you and to sort of discharge just simply by noticing it and just embracing it. Yes. So he made he sort of made the reverse process in trying to figure out what was wrong with him. There was nothing wrong with him. But then he just realized like, oh, it's those two elements, you know, that, that cause this effect. Mm -hmm. And he built that into um, to, to, yeah, a form of energy work that he called energy clearing. And this is what I learned from him. Mm -hmm. And that was the resonance for me because I've been doing uh, a lot of other types of energy work before that. But then when I met him, it was like, ah, oh, okay. Now, first of all, because he worked with people and spaces. So I think if you really look holistically, you, you have to bring those two together. Uh, but especially the way he, he did it was, uh, I just resonated with that or recognized it. 
So you don't need anything external like you know incense or uh, crystals or sage to you know to clear your space. You you have all that stuff built in, mm. which made a lot of sense to me, right? Yes. That that you have all the intelligence and technology built into the human experience to to work with that yes. because it's there. So um, I know you also clear houses, right? You yeah. Can, can I say clean as well? Yeah, clear, clean, yeah, yeah. doesn't matter. Um, is the the mechanics of, let's say, cleaning a house, is it the same as, quote-unquote, cleaning a person? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Can you talk a little bit on, let's say, uh, we are now in a very old house. This is uh, uh, Middle Ages, right? Very old, uh, yeah. 1300-something, 800 years old. Um, you enter here can you feel something and then then maybe intuitively you feel like oh i'm maybe in that room or there i need to clear up something how does that work uh yeah it works like that yeah yeah so um in a very old place like this there is like this massive history of everybody who lived here or worked here i mean life happened here right And basically what happens is people live somewhere, they have life experiences, and part of that experience gets left behind in the space. And then people move, but they leave that charge, that experience, behind in the space for the new person who starts to live there. So there is this like natural buildup of, like say, life experiences, but especially charge, energetic charge, tension, that gets left behind in the space. And that charge that gets left behind, which is like, basically the same as stress in the body that takes away the life energy from a house. So the the chi or the life force of a house is affected by the amount of, well, charge that people leave behind. Mm. So over time, that means that the energy of a place becomes more stagnant, becomes more passive. And that has an effect on your physical body because your physical body energetically is constantly negotiating with your environment and trying to figure out what the natural balance is. So if you start to live in a very old place and the energy is too low, then by nature your your physical body will adapt to that situation to be able to live there. Otherwise, you, you can't live there. So th- this is something that I notice when I enter this place is that, that there is tension in the room, which is, which is well, I would, would be surprised if it was not like 800 years old, or it may have been cleared before, of course. <laughs> That's a possibility. So it, it's just noticing a, a charge and, and an element of the energy not being optimal, yes. a, bit, a bit too low. Yes as a result of being a very old place. Yes. But that's still just a lot of charge, or maybe not so much, um, mainly caused by the people that lived here before. Yes. Because in 800 years, I'm, how long do you live here? Uh, six months. Oh, six months. Well, I mean, 800 years minus six months. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. the emphasis is, is, of course, on the previous owner occupants yes. of that place. So, um, so what would you do? Like, let's say in this room, what would you do if... Um, someone would hire you to to change the energy. Well, it depends, but but the the clearing itself is is a very simple practice. Okay. Is so what I just described. I walk into this room and I notice like like a, a sort of a heaviness, yes. right? So it would just be noticing that heaviness, feeling it, yes. acknowledging it, yes. letting it be as it is, yes. without having to change it, yes. and that changes the energy of the space, yes. because then my physical presence, or you could say my compassionate availability or presence in the room allows the charge that gets left behind in the room that is still there to dissipate. Okay, so you just being here for a couple of hours is already changing the space, okay. Yeah, and if you do it consciously, of course, it goes much quicker. Okay, but it's not like you do a bunch of rituals or... Okay. No, that's uh, that's what I like about it. It's actually... It's the realization that that the, the relationship between people and spaces is, is symbiotic. So on one hand, you live here now for six months, and the energy of the space will have an effect, will have had an effect on you in those six months. But at the same time, your awareness and that of your partner or children or just your whole family and your compassionate state will also have an effect on that space. So you balance that out, yeah. right? Um, but there is, so it just makes you aware that who. That again, it's it's the same principle of creation. That a place reflects your inner reality. Mm. So y- your availability, your compassionate awareness, mm. gets reflected in the in the space mm. uh, in terms of balance and harmony. Mm. So uh, we we just had lunch in the other room. So yeah. is that energy different from this room? 
Yes. So can you um, speak a little bit on that? Uh, yeah, well, I haven't investigated it really, but all those all these rooms feel differently because they've been used differently. And if you would, for example, like a, a typical space where you can feel that is a bedroom. And this is very logical as well, because a bedroom is a place where you sort of, let's say, average, yeah. spend like eight hours a night. You, yes. you dream, you process in a relationship, you process stuff. So that's a very typical place where people leave a lot behind, which is, you know, really different than like the toilet in the hall where you spend 10 minutes a day, right? Uh, and because in most, I don't know, I haven't seen your bedroom, but most bedrooms, I mean, as a result of how the doors are and the windows, yeah. those beds are always standing in the same place, yes. right? So it could have been like in this house that people have slept on that particular spot for yes. already 200 years. Yes. So 200 years, people leave their yes. stuff behind. Yes. So actually, you are sleeping very likely in the emotional yes. burden that people before you left behind. Yes. And there's an interaction yes. with that. So sometimes, um, well, you can, you can actually, uh, on a very sort of um, a meta level, look at a house and think like, oh, well, it's not optimal. And you can also zoom in. You can even walk around with an L rod. Maybe we yes. can do that later on and just discover how the chi is going in the room. And you can a identify individual spots where there are disturbances. Yes. And you can actually feel those. And if you stand over one of these spots where, let's say, emotions or feelings uh, get left behind, it can be a very direct experience. Yes. So... Let's say we find a place in your house where somebody felt very sad for yes. 10 years. Yes. Uh, it's very likely if you stand over that spot that you get very emotional. Yes. Because your body is just reading that information yes. and you will recognize it as sadness probably. And especially if you have some sadness in your own backpack that hasn't been sort of transformed yet. It's very likely that those two will trigger each other off. So you have an emotional experience. So... For my understanding, what, what you're doing is you're feeling it, you're noticing it, and then you bring compassion into it. Is that what you're doing? Yeah, that's you're not actually bringing compassion in it because um, for me, I use the term compassion more as a, as a description of um, the, the compassionate space that you are. So compassion is not something that you actually do or send someone or try to transfer or try to do as a technique. What actually happens is that to the degree that you are available to feel that yes. and let it be as it is, yes. that's the amount of compassion that you actually bring to the space. Yes. But that's not like either nothing or everything. It can also be like if yes. you if you feel, let's say, uh, sadness in a room, can be that you can open up your system and 30% of that charge that is there you can embrace. That's yes. your compassionate space. And beyond that 30%, if you get triggered, you go into an old conditioned response. Mm. And that's not compassion. That's mm. judgment or mm. fear or whatever. Mm. So, so, you know, can you also, let's say, clean up relationship? Uh, say you there's a couple coming to you and their yeah. marriage is not working... Yeah. so good anymore yeah and let's say the husband wants to stay in the relationship but the, the wife wants to get out yeah but the husband wants the the wife to stay in the relationship but, and you know is there something you can do for them yeah but not as that you know can, you can promise the outcome because that's the thing with compassion if it's if it's truly genuine compassion yeah. that's accepting every possibility which could also mean that you clear like the constellation of a couple or their whatever conflict they're in could also mean end of relationship. And I've encountered that multiple times. And of course, people hire me then to sort of like fix the relationship. But yeah. but I always tell them like, look, I, I can't, it's not like a voodoo, right? It's not like you sort of bring it into a certain Because direction. there's free will or? Uh... No, because that's not uh, my starting point. Yes. My starting point is to diffuse the tension in the conflict. Okay. And that basically, I mean, could very simply mean two things. Either they come together because, you know, they love each other still, and that's very obvious, or it's very obvious that they should, you know, separate and find someone else. Yes. But then then there's not the conflict that's keeping them together, even though it's not, you know, their highest purpose. So the compassion that is made available is just to bring clarity to what is best for everyone involved, mm -hmm. not my idea or one person's idea about the direction it has to go, because then you're fixing and there's a price to pay for that. <laughs> so you can't fix, so there has to be this energy of surrendering and letting go. It's not let, yeah, that's, it's not letting go, it's letting be. And that's a very different thing. So, so letting go is very often 
uh, a mind thing that means like, oh, something happens and you realize like, oh, it's not really working for me. And then you think like, I'm going to let it go. I'm going to get it out of my space and then everything is okay. So energetically, that's very often yes. fixing. Yes. And letting be has that element of, okay, you, you accept it as it is without wanting to change it, accepting every possible outcome with equanimity. And strangely enough, that the effect of that is letting go. It lets go of you. It's not letting be results in letting go. Very often, yes. yes. Yeah. You know, um, the, we were talking about this earlier, but uh, the invitation, we could see it as an experiment, right? Yes. It's an, an, it's an the invitation is an inv invitation to take part in an experiment. Yeah, but the name comes from the, from the idea that life really invites you to sort of be lived. Yes. Sure. And, and can you um, explain to me what it exactly is the invitation? Um, you mean the process? Yeah, in, in terms of you are inviting the reader, right? Yes. So, so what are you inviting them to? Well, basically, I'm inviting them to the possibility that every aspect of life can really be fully experienced, uh, can be fully embraced, that you have access to your compassionate heart and that you actually survive all those experiences. Yes. So that's basically the invitation. Yes. Um, and um, I think that's, that's what life itself, if you think about the meaning of life, is actually what life is looking for, to be loved in return, right? Yes. So, because we are unconditionally loved by life, mm -hmm. uh, and I think life offers us, us those possibilities as well to have all those experiences. So, uh, especially when it comes to entering, let's say, the subconscious or the dark side, um, I think people don't really feel invited. I think they actually feel rejected. By but, life or by, by, by what? No, not by life. No, but because life does that all the time. But I think there is this natural hesitance to go into, let's say, the shadow or the darkness because people feel unsafe. And I think that's that's a very important element also that uh, the invitation offers is that, um, especially in that process of people coming together in that community that do the same practice, is that each individual compassionate heart adds up like a little Lego block. Mm -hmm. And all those hearts together create this huge compassionate field, which which is actually a field of non-judgment, yes. of allowing, of recognition, of acknowledgement. And that provides a level of safety where people actually feel like they can enter those subconscious aspects, let trauma come up, you know, and feel supported by a community that is not judging them, but is actually offering their compassion and awareness to embrace that, something that people individually might not even, you know, mm. get around to. So there are a few steps, right? Yeah. Yeah. Can you, you know, mention the steps? Yeah. So it starts with, um, because it's, it's, it's a lot about noticing change and, and connecting to body language again. So the first step is um, uh, working with the question, what is alive in me right now? So for people, that's basically the starting point. Mm. Because if you want to notice change, especially in the interaction with life or, you know, people that you meet or places that you visit, uh, you have to be home. And this is a place where not many people spend a lot of time. And this is very much connected to, uh, to stress and to tension. So a lot of people, you know, they have stress in their lives, their body is filled with stress. And that stress or that tension gets triggered throughout the day. Yes. You know, so and when people get triggered... Uh, their awareness is either, you know, like in some story from the past or in the future. That's basically where most people hang out. They're not here, right? This yes. is Eckhart Tolle's The Power of Now, right? So getting back into the moment. They're not in the present moment. They're not. Yeah. No, not at all. I mean, their, their consciousness, their awareness is somewhere else. And if you're not home, if you're not in the moment or you're not living in the body or experience that body as a safe place, all this interaction with life happens nonetheless, but you just don't notice it. Yes. So you're basically just reacting, 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 yes. getting tired, getting stressed, worn out, burnout. But you've missed all those signals. So to be able to start noticing that again, you have to bring yourself back into that moment as often as you can. Yes. And we could say that this is probably the most important step, right? It's not the only the first one, but the most important. Well, it's basically the, the, the foundation. Yeah. The foundation, yeah. So this is where it starts, but also where it ends. Um, and in the practice of the invitation, people do that seven times a day. So the, the invitation week is like seven days. Yes. And every day you put a little alarm in your phone, like let's say every two hours. And when that alarm goes off, you ask yourself the question, what is alive for me right now? Yes. 
So that question just, you know, is like a reality check, because if you ask yourself that a couple of times, you run into all sorts of emotions and feelings and thoughts. It's, it's a very funny discovery because most people think they feel like one feeling throughout the day. Like I would ask you, like, how did you feel yesterday? Yeah, yeah I was a bit sad, but that's maybe just five minutes, you know? So if you check seven times a day how you are feeling, you notice that, you know, you go through a whole series of feelings and emotions and thoughts. So it's, yes, it's very dynamic. But the, but the interesting thing is, if, if we are in fact deliberate creators, then we can influence what is alive in us. Right. I mean, I can tune myself to l the love frequency when I wake up in the morning, yeah. or I can turn on the mainstream news, right? And that will yeah. cause that some something, you know, if 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 I tune on in, into the love frequency, something else will be alive in me. Yeah, that, definitely. Right. So very, very different experience. But that that level of choice that you are talking about. Um, is not the same for everyone. Yes. So a lot of but, but, but you and I, we want to be in a love frequency, right? Or is that also spiritual bypassing? It could be. Yeah. It depends on your, on your starting point. For a lot of people, it is. They only want to be in the love frequency. Okay. Because the dark frequencies or the low frequencies, I mean, people just move around that, right? They, they, they circle it. They just want to, don't want to go there. So only by focusing on the light... If that is at the expense of the lower frequencies, that, that's spiritual bypassing. But you can, that's but never going to work. But you can only tune into one radio frequency at a time. So how does that work? I mean, how can you be in love frequency and experience the, the darker, lower frequency at the same time? Uh, well, if it's there, you will encounter it. I mean, Both at the same time? Uh, well, maybe not in your human... Consciousness, I think it, it's it, it's difficult, but I think it's still there. So eventually, it will show up. Okay. So you can focus on the love frequency and hang out there for a while, or really emphasize on doing that. Yes. But then eventually, if if that lower frequency is not met, if it's not experienced, if it's not embraced, yes. it will come knocking on your door sooner or later. Maybe this lifetime or another lifetime. So could we then really say that on a deeper level, um, love embraces all? The frequencies. If you are really in a love frequency yes. all the time, there are no lower. I mean, there are no issues with lower frequencies. Okay, exactly. So maybe we we should look at the definition of love because yeah, that's uh, the thing. Of yeah, course, yes, yeah. yes, yes. The, how I use the term love or compassion is that it includes everything, including the the low. I mean, it, it includes every frequency. It's all inclusive. Yes. And if it's really all inclusive, and this is something that you can't fake that. It's not like it's not like a mind thing, right? If you are really afraid and you think like, okay, I know that I only have to focus on positive thoughts and nice feelings. I'm, I don't I shouldn't focus on being afraid. But at the same time, if that fear is still part of your system, if it's not made aware, it will knock on your door, right? You have to do. It's not going away because you don't think about it. Okay. That's that's just on the level of the mind. And a lot of people also who practice the invitation come to that discovery. So they think like, oh, you know, there's, there was a problem in my life, I dealt with it, I've gone through therapy, yoga, meditation, done mm -hmm. all the things, I've integrated it, I've given it a place, you know, I've seen through it, all those things. And then when people really inv invite it, they discover that there's still a lot there that they haven't processed. Yes. So how the mind deals with something is just one aspect of it. Yes. And a lot of people discover that on an energetic level, they haven't dealt with it at all. Yes. But should that not be the starting point, always the energetical level? Well, I think that's what you discover through this process. Yes. It, it, it yes. invites you yes. to really feel it on every level. Yes. So you don't, try, you don't try to sort of mentalize it by figuring out what it is or take a therapeutic approach. You're going into the direct experience. Yes. So, so okay, if, if I would do the invitation, you know, day one, first day, first time I ask that question, you do, you do it seven times per day? Yeah. That's a lot. Yeah. Uh, so seven times per day, and I ask myself, okay, what's alive in me right now? And I could say, you know, um, it's Sunday, and I just feel relaxed, and there's not a lot of pressure right now. Um, is, is that enough yeah. as an answer? It's, yeah. Well, if that's what's there, if yeah. that's what you notice, yes. and you are fine with that, you know, yes. and you just let that be, fine. Okay. And then when you checked out two hours later, it can be something totally yes. different because something happened in the meantime, you get really upset, yes. and then you check again, what's alive for me right now? Ah, oh, there is upset, there is yes. irritation. Yes. And then that's the thing, of course, to notice and to embrace. Let it be as it is without trying to change that irritation. And this is what people discover, that 
although the practice is really simple, yes. noticing and letting it be, I mean, yeah. it doesn't get much simpler than that. If people get triggered and they try to let it be from a, from a place of mind, but their body reacts because they get triggered, they find out that they can't let it be, yes. or just a very small part. And, and this is exactly what the process is designed to take them to, to that edge where you actually reach the boundaries of your comfort zone and you get triggered. So triggers normally have a very negative connotation, right? We don't like to get triggered. But in this approach, exactly where you get triggered, that's the space where you can grow. Because very simply put, you have three zones. If you react to something, there is like your comfort zone, and that's the space where you are compassionate, where you can experience things, you can let them be as they are, everything is okay. And then you have like what I call the trigger zone. So that's where you reach the boundaries of your comfort zone and things start to get a little bit like, oh, you can't let it be. You start to react and judge and fear and, you know, think about stuff. But it's, the, the trigger reaction is not so intense yet that you are, that it's beyond your control, right? So, and especially in that area where you get triggered, where you start to notice that, that you get stimulated, this is where you apply this process of noticing that reaction, whatever it is, and you let it be as it is. So you let the trigger be as it is. And the weird thing is that if you acknowledge the trigger reaction, it will lose its power and it will just get integrated. And then that trigger zone that was initially a part of the boundaries of your comfort zone will get integrated into your comfort zone. So your comfort zone grows, your compassionate space grows. Mm -hmm. And then beyond that trigger zone, there is like what I call the reaction zone. And this is where you go into the subconscious mm -hmm. where there is a very strong pattern or reaction or charge that mm -hmm. gets triggered, but it's so strong that it just takes you over. You just go into automatic response of disconnecting or checking out or being angry, yes. right? So the, the whole design of the invitation is to to let that compassionate space grow by actually have yourself triggered throughout, let's say, a week of practice. Mm. And you apply that principle of noticing and compassion to that trigger zone. And then you become more compassionate over time, over time, over time, until the point that you are fully compassionate, which means that you can feel something, you are totally aware of the noticing of it, but there is no trigger reaction anymore. And is then there a greater sense of freedom when there's no more trigger reaction? Yes, totally. Okay. And, and the strange thing is that, that it doesn't mean, like in this example, we talk about anger. Um, so if you, have, if you are fully compassionate for anger, it doesn't mean that you never run into anger again in your life. Because that's what the mind thinks. Like, oh, okay, I embrace this anger, I'm free of that. Yeah. But you're not free of anger, and that's not the point, because uh, anger is just an aspect of life. But you are free of the adverse reaction to anger. So you're not judging that anger anymore. You're not fear, you just become available, right? Mm -hmm. And it could also mean that because you are fully compassionate around that anger is that you start to invite other people in your environment that have anger issues that can't process that anger, but the charge they are holding will scan the environment if there is someone there who is compassionate enough to embrace that anger for them. Mm -hmm. So even if you have fully embraced that anger in yourself, it could still mean you run into angry people and you will feel their anger because that's what they are transmitting, but it won't trigger you anymore. Mm -hmm. And you are actually, because you are noticing it, you are embracing it, helping the other person, and this is also part of the design of the invitation, by actually being available to others with awareness and compassion. You can help the other person mm -hmm. to relieve them of the charge that they can't embrace themselves. So, so in, 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 again, to the relationship. Um, so the man wants to stay in the relationship, the woman wants to leave the relationship. Yeah. So what are, are they mirroring to each other? Could be many things. Yeah, it could be identical issues that they trigger in each other, which is very challenging because they can come to the point that this is what you call gridlock. I mean, they can't help each other anymore, right? They still push the same buttons all the time. But it could also mean that for, let's say, let's say for example, uh, the woman has to is challenged because she has to set boundaries, and the man is challenged because to you know he has to be more considerate. So that's like individual processes, but the relationship empowers them to sort of work that out. Mm. But if there is not enough awareness of that, then they will just react, mm. and it's you know it's pointless. You're not going to resolve it yes. because there's not enough consciousness on what's happening. Yeah, there's not enough awareness yeah. of, because the the the. the, the um, the underlying uh, programming, you could say, in the subconscious and by association, the charge they build up is so strong that once they trigger each other, that reaction is so immediate and intense that they get triggered into that response and they become that response. So there is no 
there is no reaction time that they can zoom out and think like, okay, what's happening? They, they have physically, physiologically become that reaction. Yes. So there's all sorts of chemicals in their body that, yes. you know, and they just have to sit it out. Yes. And this is where the compassion can help because if, if I would work with a couple like that and I would sort of embrace the man and embrace the woman, ideally that would help them sort of to lower the charge which makes, if they trigger each other, the trigger response a bit less intense and hopefully a lot less intense. And then if they trigger each other, but they're not like so reactive, there might be a bit more room to look at it from a different perspective. Or like, oh, okay, see what you're doing, see what I'm doing. Yes. And then maybe you have a conversation, yes. you know? Yes. So this is where it can help. But the underlying patterns, because that, those are two important things. You have, you have the charge, so like the tension in the body, which is the result of like, you know, subconscious programming over time, many different factors. And this is quite easy to sort of relieve people off, right? So the charge is just, that falls away. And you notice that like, oh, nice and lighter and more energy. Yes. But, but the patterns underlying yes. the buildup of that charge, I mean, they are very um, difficult to change. I think everybody would sort of... So this, is all, this is all through conditioning, right? Those are yeah. all... Cool. Yeah, th this is the most difficult part, that in that 90% subconscious lies this massive yes. mix of conditioning of many factors, which yes. is your genetics, it's yes. your the stuff that happens in your family system, right? Yes. That's Bert Hellinger's work, uh, family constellations, yes. it's what happens in your past lives, yes. uh, it's what happened in your early youth, especially. And then we also, uh, you mentioned uh, Bruce Lipton uh, earlier before the interview. Yeah. You, you know, you Bruce Lipton, Joe Dispenza. Yeah. Um, Bruce Lipton is really interesting because he says that we can change it. We can, yeah. yeah. And and this is how it happens. You actually, uh, well, his work is of course in genetics and what they found out is that, I mean, we store like generations of information in our genetics. Uh, I think it's what they found like 14 generations before us is stored in our genes. But what he says or what they discovered is what activates that potential is our environment and not so much our external environment, but our internal environment yes. decides which genes get switched on and off on the switchboard. Yes. So if you clean up your inner environment, and this is part of the process, of course, also what the invitation does, but also good food, enough sleep, you know, a good energetic hygiene, you could say that changes your inner environment and that activates all sorts of um, stuff in your genes that puts extra potential on, right? So that's really interesting that as a result of our awareness and our consciousness, we can change our genes, which is quite revolutionary because not so long ago we thought like your genes were sort of a lottery, right? You have good genes and you're clever, good looking, all that stuff, or maybe not, yes. but that was it. Yes. And now it, it becomes really obvious that everything, including our genes, is subject to our awareness. So if our awareness changes, Yes. then that whole situation changes. So, so, so practices like gratitude, um, we mentioned compassion many times, um, reverence for life, yeah. uh, meditation, are they, are they important? Very important, yes. yes, yes, because they will change your inner world. Yes. Yeah. But I think that what's, apart from what sort of practice it is, I think the starting point is really uh, determining what the effect is. So you can also meditate from a point of like polarity and resistance. And I yes. think a lot of people do that, right? Yes. So they are like a crazy lifetime. They're really angry and stressed out. And then like they meditate to sort of like become a little bit relaxed, but they don't really address yes. the reason why they are so yes. stressed or angry. Yes. So that's never going to work. Yes. So, so let, let's talk a lot of people, especially younger people when they're watching, they, they still, you know, are very focused on creating the life they want, right? Mm. And and and, and um, there there's so many books out, especially in, in the Netherlands uh, right now, about manifesting. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Gil Bale has many guests. Yeah. Um, and 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 if, if someone would come to you and they have a vision board with the house they want, the car they want, the, let's say the boyfriend they want, um, and they say, hey, you know, um, can you help me? To, <laughs> yeah. you know, manifest everything on this vision board. Yeah. How would you uh, support them? What, 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 how would you help them? Uh, by suggesting to throw away the vision board. And why? To start with that. Yes. 
because I would want to make them aware that the vision they have now is based on who they are now. Yes. And part of who they are now is, of course, like a big part subconscious. Yes. Yes. So they want this at the expense of something else. Yes. And this is a big reason why they never get it. Yes. But also, if they get it, then it's not sustainable because yes. there's a big part they have denied that still you know, comes back with a vengeance. Yes. Plus that um, the things that we sort of envision as part of a better world or the stuff we want, I mean, in a way, if you look at what people want, it's very limited, right? Yes. So uh, that, I don't you, see... You, you mean with limited, very materialistic, very superficial or... Yeah, in a way. And even what we envision as a better world is... I think it's just such a small part of what we are really capable of as human beings. But I don't think we can see that unless we integrate the full human experience. And from that place of, you know, what, I, what Jung said, the third way is, is let something else emerge uh, that is so much richer and so much more profound in changing like what it really means to be like a next level humanity and a different society. For me, it's hard to visualize what you're talking about. You know, can you help me a little bit with what, what are you talking about for our audience? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I think I also find it difficult to, to sort of describe what sort of world it would be. But I'm, I'm, it's more like I'm trying to describe the principle that um, if we try to create a better world from something that we don't want anymore, we only focus on that that we what that we do want. so we don't want war right nobody yes. wants war we want peace yes. but we don't really th i don't think we really understand what peace means yes. so we only think of peace means no war yes. right but i think peace in a much bigger bigger perspective means that you are okay with everything that life has to offer including the war so i once written a column like if you want world peace you have to embrace the war yes. which basically describes that whole principle right because I think part of the reason that we don't have world peace yet is because we go on the street and we demonstrate against the war, which is understandable. Of course, but there's also uh, so much money made um, when there's war. I mean, there's a whole industry behind the war. It's it's yeah. the, the, the system is so sick, and yeah. I think that's part of you know the waking up. I mean, that stuff all comes to the surface, yeah. which is great. So we... And I think part of our growing up as a humanity has to has to be like the acknowledgement and, and the admission that um, that we are capable of doing that. That as a, as a human race, we are we can you know we have the full spectrum. We can love unconditionally, but we can also destroy unconditionally. Yes. And until we acknowledge that that we can do that, and we actually do it right because it's happening. It's happening right now. And until we really acknowledge it and embrace that, and by embracing, I don't mean approve it, but acknowledging that that's also part of a human experience, we will, sti we will still see that coming back until we actually make it aware and we really embrace it. Yes. So, so we have a responsibility, not only on a personal level, but also on a collective level. Yes. Because, you know, there's, uh, I think, 100% chance that Russia will...